to uh, answer any questions that you might have. But in order to do so, you have a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. Um, so it is a Zoom webinar. And so with the Zoom application, there is a Q&A, a question and answer uh, button for you to access. Uh, at any point in time, if you have any questions for us, uh, we will be happy to address those questions. And we'll go ahead and get to all of those questions at the conclusion of today's webinar. Also, today's webinar is also being recorded. So in case you uh, want to revisit uh, the webinar or you know of someone who was unable to participate, uh, we will have that recording, of, that recording available for everyone to see. All right, so let's go ahead and get started about transitioning your child to in-person kindergarten. I do want to start with a, uh, a brief introduction uh, about myself and my partner who is going to be uh, pre presenting along with me. Uh, first and foremost, my name is Jason Weinich. I am the principal here at Judy Budget School, the Akron campus. Um, just a little bit of a background about myself. I have been with the organization now for about 12 years. Uh, originally, I started at the uh, Judy Bird Lynnhurst campus as a teacher and an assistant principal. And then as we moved uh, down to Akron to open up our second campus, uh, I became principal of our Akron campus. Um, so I do welcome you, and I do want to introduce our co-presenter for today as well. Hi everyone, my name is Alyssa Spalik. I am an intervention specialist with second grade here at Julie Billiard. Um, I've been with JB for three years now. I've taught preschool in the past, preparing kids for kindergarten. And then I also have taught first grade as well. Okay, uh, you will notice that uh, myself and Alyssa will be switching out uh, throughout the course of the webinar as we will be presenting on different topics today. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, we're talking about your child's transition to an in-person school next year for kindergarten. Um, as we know, this past year has been a tough year for so many students across the nation um, with the COVID pandemic and uh, many of our, our kids, whether it's at the preschool level or at the school age level, uh, were faced with a, a difficult situation of being at home in a remote learning environment. Uh, thankfully here at Judy Budget School, we had the opportunity to be in person all year long um, and uh, we're very blessed to do so. Um, but it's time for you to be thinking about getting your child ready to be in person in kindergarten for next school year. And so we want to talk about what are those steps uh, that you can be taking throughout the course of the next several months, throughout the course of the springtime and into the summer uh, to get your child ready for that full day of kindergarten. Um, and that's a major difference. You know, for many preschool programs, uh, you are looking at a half day program that may be anywhere from two to five days a week. Um, and so things such as building up our endurance, getting ready for the kindergarten year is a difficult task, uh, but it is a task that can be accomplished. And it takes a, a support system around the student. And that support system does include you as the parent. 
Um, so before your child even steps foot in the, the kindergarten classroom, there are things that you can do uh, to help support him or her uh, to get them ready. Um, one of the major things that you're gonna see once your child steps it into that kindergarten classroom is from an academic standpoint, a social and a behavioral standpoint, there's a dramatic increase of expectations uh, for your child in comparison to the preschool level. Uh, think back when you were in kindergarten uh, and you think about the academic component, um, it's quite different uh, than it used to be. Uh, certainly there is a, a, a big drive uh, nowadays to uh, really push in those uh, pre-reading, pre-math skills uh, to help our students get ready for the rest of their school age education. So, um, you know, know that the, the most important thing, um, you know, for, for any child is those first several phases of their education. Preschool, starting with preschool, first and foremost, uh, a very uh, critical element. You know, we always talk about early intervention and that early intervention starts at that preschool level. Um, but then we move into kindergarten and early intervention continues to uh, happen in the kindergarten uh, year. And there's so much growth and so much development that is needed to happen over the course of that first year of school age uh, schooling. Um, and it's because we do need to build those academic skills, we need to build those social skills, and we need to build those behavioral skills that are going to carry your child from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade and get them ready for a career or a college uh, future. Okay, so the first step that you're probably going to want to take is to just investigate what the options are and what is going to be expected of your child during the day. Um, so one of the big components would be the organization of their day and how they organize themselves. So when they come in, in the beginning of the day, they're going to have to unpack their backpack, turn in a homework folder, other papers, and they need to know what spot that needs to go to and get into that routine. So that's kind of the beginning of the day and then transitioning through their day from one activity to the other, how to properly put things back where they belong and move on to the next task. And then at the end of the day, they're going to have to find all of their things, pack up everything that they need, go through their routine and move on to going home and transitioning there. So what supports are going to be needed for your child to do this? What is your child already able to do? And then try to think of what the teacher might need to support your child. What, what is the teacher providing to help that child? And then um, visuals are a huge part of helping kids with this process. So maybe just a picture of, oh, your folder goes in this spot, your backpack goes in this spot. So they learn where these things need to go and what's expected of them. Now in kindergarten, the academics, do increase from preschool. So um, focusing on reading, writing, and math, take a look at how much time is spent with each of those subjects. Um, usually in center time, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, sitting and focused on that task in their space and moving on through their day. Um, and then taking a look at how this, the class is set up. Is it a whole group setting? Are the academics being taught in small group? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? What would be best for your child? Every child is different. And say maybe your child struggles with reading. How, how can we support that child? What will the teacher need to do to make sure that the child is um, growing and improving in their reading skills? And another important thing to look at is the curriculum because curriculums are different everywhere you go. So be thinking about which curriculum would best fit your child. Some move at a faster pace than others, some are more detailed, some give a broad, just explanation of things and moving on. So where will your child thrive? Do they need that extra explanation? Do they need a very clean looking paper? Um, or are they able to move things through things quickly? Those are all really important things to be looking at to find out which setting fits your child best. And then socially. Um, there are a lot of social times for your child in kindergarten throughout the day. Obviously, there's recess time 
and playing time, but kindergarten days are um, focused on centers. They're built up around centers. So your child will be moving from one center to the other. One will be a reading center, doing a reading activity, and then transitioning to a math activity and then a play activity. And the focus here is going to be moving from that parallel play, just playing next to a friend, doing your own thing, not really engaging with that peer, and um, moving into cooperative play, playing a game back and forth with somebody, building those social skills. Um, so just take a look at what social opportunities are provided and what supports your child would need to participate in those social activities and have success. Um, and then you wanna take a look at which therapists are going to be able to be there to support your child. Is there a speech uh, therapist, an occupational therapist, physical therapist? Take a look at your child's needs and see if that is provided within that kindergarten. All right, to continue on. So, you know, as we continue to forward, you know, the important thing to keep in mind is, you know, there's an environment for every child. And so when you take a look at your child's current abilities with academic skills, particularly the pre-kindergarten readiness skills, um, when you take a look at the, your child's current social development and the social competencies that they currently exhibit, uh, as well as behavioral needs, you, when you look at all three of those elements, there is a particular environment that is going to be best fit for your child. And you figure that out by matching your child's needs with the services, with the supports, with the interventions uh, that are provided through the school. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that you want to keep in mind is frustrations are going to be present. You know, particularly for a child that has an academic struggle, a child who may need support socially, uh, a child who has behaviors that need to be supported throughout the course of a school day. Uh, there's going to be frustrations that naturally come from there, but it is absolutely critical that the school is able to provide the assistance, the support to alleviate those frustrations, to develop coping skills and so forth. So that way we can continue to grow again, academically, socially, and behaviorally. There's a number of different strategies. There's a number of different in interventions that are out there uh, that can be truly effective for students, but they are one of kind and they are unique to each individual student. So as you're starting to look at the kindergarten year and you start to look at schools uh, in, for the next year ahead, you know, one of the, the questions that you want to ask yourself is, you know, my child is struggling with these elements. I know my child is going to need support uh, in their kindergarten class for these areas. Again, academic, behaviorally. But I want to know, you know, based on my child's needs, what is what are going to be some of the interventions, what are going to be some of the supports that will help my child through this process. Uh, the last thing that you want is for your, your child to be just another student in the classroom and for them not to be fully supported in all of their developmental areas. Because um, if that's true, then, you know, that early intervention piece that goes by the wayside and that will continue to have impacts year after year after year. So first and foremost, we got to focus on kindergarten. We got to focus on the strategies and the intervention, interventions that are most appropriate right now for your child. Um, the other part of it is, you know, when your child goes to school next year, in kindergarten, they're going to be spending six, six and a half hours with their teachers, with their intervention specialists, with their therapists and other staff members in the building. That's six and a half hours out of the 24 hours in a day. And so when you think about that, there is so much more support, so much more development that needs to happen outside of the school setting as well. And so that's where the unified approach between school and home certainly needs to happen. And so one of the things that you want to take a look at and see, you know, when you're looking at specific schools is how am I going to be notified of these strategies and these interventions that are working? Because um, you need to know, you want to know, 
Uh, because if you don't know, you don't know what you need to do at home to, to continue to support your child. And so if there's a specific academic uh, intervention that is going to help with letter recognition or you know, initial sound recognition within a consonant vowel consonant word, you need to know what that strategy is that your teacher, your child's teacher is working on with your child. Uh, because your child is going to come home with homework uh, with other at home uh, instruction that needs to be accomplished. And you wanna make sure that your child is able to generalize skill sets from one environment to the next. And one way to do so is to make sure that you are informed of the strategies and the interventions that work for your child. Same thing from a social side. You know, inside the classroom, there are a variety of different supports schools can use. Uh, here at Judy Bell, you know, you walk into one of our classrooms, whether that's the kindergarten classroom or the second grade classroom, you're gonna find a number of different social supports, whether they are through social stories, uh, whether they are through the language that we use with our students through the social thinking curriculum, just a number of different approaches to help our students work through social situations. Um, it is not the student's fault when they don't know how to work through a situation. It's not that they didn't want to work through a social situation, it's that they don't know how. And if you don't know how, that is a lack of a skill set, and it becomes the teacher's responsibility to be able to teach your child to do so. But then that information needs to be transferred over to you as the parent, uh, so that way you can be informed. Now, the other part of it is, is yes, you can gain all this information of these interventions and these strategies that uh, you know is working for your child, but you got to know how to use them, and that's where that coaching aspect comes into play. Um, and so, one of the things that you want to keep an, uh, an open mind about as you're looking at schools is, well. I know my, you know, I have teachers, I have a support team that is working with my child. How are they gonna support me as well as a parent? What type of coaching, what type of support will I be provided? Um, because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a, a solution that is going to improve the quality of life for not only for the child, but also for the family as a whole. And so you need to be coached on how to implement a lot of these strategies and interventions so that way your child can have success in the school setting as well as success in the home setting as well. Okay, so you're hearing about all of these different parts of a typical kindergarten day. And you're probably wondering, how can I start to prepare my child to be able to have success in this? Um, so how can we build up their endurance to get through the whole kindergarten day? Step one would be to start weaning off the midday naps. Maybe instead of having the time where they go to sleep, have some just calm and relaxed time, maybe reading a book or coloring a picture, something where they are just calm, not fully asleep, but get to kind of reload and get ready for the rest of their day. I know many kindergartners, uh, they have siesta time or just a break time where they just take some 15, 20 minutes to just chill and regain all of their strength to get through the second half of their day. Another thing would be to focus on playing with an academic activity or a game for a longer duration of time. So 15 to 20 minutes instead of playing with blocks for two minutes and then moving over to another game and all of these fun different activities that they want to get to start to build up their endurance to stick with one task. And then when the timer goes off, we can move to the next task and transitioning to another preferred activity. Um, and another thing with this, teaching them to clean up after themselves. So I'm done playing with the blocks. I need to put the blocks away before I can go play with the train set. Um, another strategy would to have a designated space at home where the child can sit and play, write, draw for extended periods of time. That's their workspace. So during the school day, your child's going to have their desk. Maybe it'll be a spot on the carpet that they are expected to stay in their, their bubble. Um, and they won't be able to be walking all about all of the time. They're expected to stay in a spot. So just start learning that skill at home that I'm expected to stay in this seat 
for 15 minutes until that timer goes off, and then I'm able to move on to my next task. All right, so referencing uh, a comment that I made at the very start of the webinar, and that is the, um, you know, the time between now and this upcoming August is absolutely critical. It's very important. There's so much growth and so much development that happens. Um, you know, a little back history again about myself. I, uh, I mentioned that I started, you know, I was a teacher at the Lindhurst campus, and actually I was one of the kindergarten intervention specialists. And, you know, taking a look at how much growth happens in one period of time um, at the kindergarten level and particularly at the kindergarten level is astronomical. I mean, when you take a look at the course of one day, one week, one month, how much growth can occur um, for, for any child, whether it's a typical developing child or a child who has learning deficits, social deficits uh, that need to be addressed. There is so much growth that can happen, um, but we need to be proactive. We need to take the, the right steps uh, in order to help promote growth. And over the course of the summer here, there's a number of things that you can do. Um, we're gonna go ahead and talk through a few of those items. Um, now, just keep in mind too, when you, when you take a look at your child, you wanna take a look at the whole picture, you know, from an academic, a social, behavioral, independence, um, all those areas are absolutely important uh, to uh, help support and help your child develop into a well-rounded school age student. And so starting with writing skills, you know, writing skills are, are tough, especially for a child who may have a learning disability. Um, the task of writing uh, can be strenuous. There's a lot of endurance that needs to be created uh, to support the writing process. There's a lot of coordination, a lot of fine motor skills uh, that goes into the process. And so writing is just, you know, there's so much involved. And so one of the things that you want to help support your child in is always color with a model. You know, we give our child a, a coloring sheet and they start coloring, um, but if they don't have a model as a representation, it's very hard for them to conclude what my end result should be. And we wanna you know, focus on coloring. We wanna give more and more opportunities to color, but color appropriately. And we talk about coloring appropriately when there's a model in place. So that way the students can reference what the end result should be. So what's the connection between coloring and writing? Well, in writing, there's always a final result. There's a final outcome that we're shooting for. Um, and it's the same exact approach for coloring as well. But before we get into the writing process, we need to continue to work on those fine motor skills. We need to work on the ability to create endurance and uh, doing, by doing so, we do that through coloring. And I know you might be thinking, oh, my child just doesn't like coloring. Um, that's understood. That is absolutely understood. Um, but it is something that we do need to put in place for our kids, even though it's an unpreferred activity. Um, and you do that by making it part of routine. Make, you know, make a, a, a section of your evening, a 20, uh, a 20 minute uh, part of the evening, a coloring time. Um, routine and structure is absolutely vital. Begin writing on structured paper. I can't stress enough uh, the, uh, the importance of providing structure to your child when they are just starting to learn the process for anything. There needs to be boundaries, there needs to be parameters, and we do that in the writing process by providing structured writing paper uh, that clearly on, you know, outlines a, a baseline for their letters, a skyline for you know, where their letters should be expanding up to, um, but we do need to give the students some sense of uh, a boundary and representation on their writing sample. Um, now, you can think, you know, think of, you know, you give your child a blank piece of white paper and you can, you know, for many of our kids right away, they start to lose, you know, spatial understanding of where their letters should appear on paper. Uh, that's because there's no boundary. There's no structure that's included. So as you start to uh, introduce the writing process to your child, make sure that you are using structured writing paper. And then another important aspect is let your child see and hear you writing. We learn through our five senses 
and we have to use all five senses to establish skills. And so, yes, it's important for your child to be practicing by writing, but it's also equally important for them to see you write and hear you write as well. Talk about how you're forming your letters. Talk about how your letters are sitting on the ground line. Talk about how your letters are not floating away on the paper and continue to talk about that every time you're writing with your child. They need to hear that, they need to see that. Um, and by doing so, that will naturally become part of their process as well as they develop their writing skills. Math skills. Uh, so next up, beyond writing, we're moving into math, very important. And what can you do at home? Well, focus on number sense. A number of sense is con the connection between writing a number and the quantity, the actual symbol, the, num uh, the number symbol versus the quantity. If you focus on anything, the only thing that I would ask you to focus on is developing an understanding between that connection. That connection is going to carry that child well beyond uh, where they need to be. Um, and that can be a difficult process sometimes, just establishing that there is truly a connection between the symbol the number five versus what the quantity of five looks and means and what that looks like when I count. And so that can be done through, again, your representation, helping, you know, having flashcards with the symbols, with the number of symbols already there and demonstrating that there is a connection between that symbol and a quantity of objects. And you can use all sorts of objects to help represent that, and certainly you want to. You never want to stick to one's particular manipulative or one particular way of counting. You want to provide many, many different opportunities and examples uh, to your child. So again, that way they can generalize that skill set from one activity to another. Moving into the pre-reading skills. Uh, you know, as your child steps in the kindergarten, you know, they're going to start with letter identification, move into letter sound identification, uh, into recognizing sight words, to starting to decode uh, simple words that uh, have a, a consonant, vowel consonant pattern. Um, so it's a process, but there are things that you can do at home to help support that. And one of, the, one of the best things that you can do is read with your child. Exposure, exposure, exposure is absolutely important. Uh, if we don't provide that exposure early on, uh, that can be detrimental. We need to make sure that we are reading with our kids uh, in the home setting to, to set them up for success. Just like I mentioned in the writing process, using their five senses to understand and witness that process, they need to be able to use their five senses to witness the reading process as well. And you can do that as you're reading aloud to your child, demonstrating how you are reading from left to right on the paper. It's very important for you to recognize that you are reading words on paper, you are reading from left to right. There's a connection between the words that you are reading and the pictures that are represented on the page. Um, it's important for you to take a pause while you are reading and, and you come to that, that, that word such as cap. And when you get come to that word cap, you go k, a, p, cap, demonstrating how you simply sound out a word. And you want to do that repetitively. You know, more, the more and more you can do that while you are in the reading process with your child, the more and more exposure that they're gonna see, oh, so that's how mom sounds out a word, or that's how dad sounds out a word. And then they're gonna pick up that skill. And then they're gonna be able to generalize that skill uh, in their own reading as well. So again, there's, there's nothing more that I can stress than the fact of reading with your child first and foremost, but when you are reading, make it intentional. Make it intentional by really thinking about what are all the skills that I'm using right now to read to my child. There's, the skills are recognizing letters, recognizing how I put uh, a beginning sound, a middle sound, and an ending sound together. Recognizing how, wait a minute, this word that I see, this word tree, oh, that's a picture in this book as well. And drawing those connections, all of those connections are incredibly important as you're reading. 
fine motor skills. Um, you think about the course of a child's school day, uh, fine motor skills come into play across the board. It, not just when they're writing, it's not just when they're packing up to go home for the day. Fine motor skills are absolutely important to be able to be a group participant in center time. Uh, fine motor skills are important to be able to be a group participant outside at recess with other students. And so we need to build up confidence. We need to build up uh, courage within our students with their fine motor skills. And that starts with understanding our students' coordination, hand motor uh, control, hand strength control, and those activities that you can do, um, starting with using Play-Doh, or if you can, if you can get your hands on some therapy, that is even better. Um, but Play-Doh is readily available, but like I said, if you can get some therapy, that is even better, where you start putting objects like pennies and other beads inside of that putty, inside of that uh, Play-Doh, get them, uh, hide them in there, nice and tight and have your child use their pincher grips to pull them out of that therapy, pull them out of that uh, Play-Doh. And we're gonna be strength, uh, strengthening those pincher grasp uh, as well as other coordination. Uh, tearing paper into small pieces and then crumbling them into balls. Sounds very simple, but very important. Uh, again, be able to you know, be, be able to use our pincher grasp to tear paper apart, um, which can be difficult. You know, you think about it, if you give your child a piece of paper right now and you ask them to tear it, what does that process look like for them? Are they using a palm grass where they're trying to pull that paper apart? Or are they, you know, finessing it with their pincher grasp and, and pulling it? We need to get to a point where they're using their pincer grasp uh, to be able to tear that paper apart. Drawing and scribbling uh, vertically. Um, so think about it. Whenever we're writing, we're writing on a tabletop. It's flat on the table, and that's actually not the best way to develop our wrist strengths and our coordination. Uh, so find a, a room in the house, um, pref preferably not a room that you just painted, but find a room in the house where you can go ahead and tape a piece of paper up on the wall uh, where you can go ahead and have your child practice coloring, uh, practice writing uh, on that paper in a vertical position that will help strengthen that wrist muscle, uh, which will uh, transfer over to tabletop writing. And social skills, um, social skills vitally important. And you know, right now during during a time of the COVID pandemic, this has been an area that is a major concern uh, for a lot of kids uh, early on in their development. Um, perhaps preschool has been remote, and the number of interactions have decreased dramatically, and that's a concern. Uh, we need to build our students up socially so that way they're ready for kindergarten. And one of the ways of doing so is having structured conversations with your child. I, you know, I would encourage you not to leave it open-ended for a lot of our kids uh, early on. You want to have a structured approach in your conversations. And you can do that by starting with to uh, topic conversation starters, um, where you have a topic jar and you're pulling out a different topic each night uh, to talk about. Um, and when you're having those conversations, you want your questions to your child to be very direct. Again, not open-ended questions, very direct, uh, where they have a, a very concrete response to. And then you can move your way into more inferential thinking and more abstract thinking, and those conversations can become more and more open-ended. But right now, you want to make sure that you're giving your child specific questions uh, to answer to that are related to a common topic. You want to practice the back and forth conversation as well, too, demonstrating how we need to, when someone speaks, we need to listen to that information, take it in, and provide some output. And we do that through modeling, you know, have a, another sibling uh, sit with you, where preferably it's an older sibling, where you're demonstrating the back and forth conversation. Maybe it's the back and forth conversation between mom and dad, but you do want to demonstrate how you're taking turns, how you're listening to one person, thinking about the information that you just heard, and then responding.
All right, so we are just about coming to a conclusion of our presentation here. Um, there's a couple of things before we move into uh, the question and answer phase of this webinar. Um, one, I do want to introduce you to three upcoming webinars that are gonna be uh, coming up on March 24th, uh, 24th, March 31st and April 7th. Um, and so the first one's gonna be what to look for uh, in, in the kindergarten if your child has special learning needs. So we'll be really focusing on different learning needs from a social standpoint and an academic standpoint. Um, the second one coming up is how to know if your child is ready for kindergarten. Uh, perhaps your child is on that bridge. Uh, maybe they just turned five, you know, maybe they have a mid-July uh, birthday when they're turning five. You know, is this the right time to start kindergarten? Well, we're going to give you some insight in what, uh, what you should be thinking about. And then the elements of the kindergarten, what to expect in your, first, your child's first year. We're gonna be taking a look specifically at a kindergarten classroom and going through the day from start to finish and taking a look at what, what it is that your child's gonna be experiencing uh, throughout that first year. Um, so just a reminder now that uh, you do have that Q&A button uh, that question and answer button available to you uh, to ask some questions. And I do see some questions already coming in. And uh, so before I start answering any questions, I do wanna thank everyone for being here with us. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at the email that you see listed here on the screen. That's the admissions at jbschool.org. Uh, we would certainly be happy to help you uh, kind of navigate your way uh, as you're looking ahead at the kindergarten year. So let's go ahead and get into some questions here. Uh, we have a few that have already popped up. And so starting with the first one here, uh, the question is, all of the suggestions for the various subjects are great. Uh, do any of these take into account with our communication barriers with their speech? Are there modifications for this to keep in mind? Absolutely. So, you know, know that you know, every child from a communication standpoint is developing at a different rate. And that's sometimes just naturally how things develop. And there are modifications, there are things that you can do uh, to assist in this process. For instance, you know, if your child is right now struggling with communication, maybe they are at a state where um, their verbal responses are, are single words, you know, one word responses right now. And you want to uh, increase uh, the, the, the number of words provided within a single response. And so one of the things that, you know, we need to do is create visuals. We need to, uh, uh, make a connection between verbal language and visuals. And oftentimes when we, our brain reads things uh, in different ways. So let's say that we want to have a student say uh, the phrase, um, the big tree, okay? Well, we're gonna model for them the, and then big and then tree. And then you're going to provide some visuals that come along with that. You can print out simple pictures, pull up pictures on your phone uh, of a tree, um, but have the student practicing the big and then point to the, to the, the picture tree. Um, and that's gonna be the, the initial step in the process. And you wanna provide repetition and additional practice in that process, but the idea is certainly to try to make a connection between verbal language and visuals. We'll have Alyssa answer the next question for us. Okay, so there's a question here about the um, topic jar at the dinner table. And this is really up to you. Whatever you think that um, would be exciting for your child to talk about or you wanna learn more about your child, um, have fun with this. It can be basic as like, do you like the hamburger? And just a simple yes or no. And then maybe expand it further to what is your favorite food? And then, um, even further, the fav my favorite part of the day was. So you can start really small where it's yes or no. I like something, I don't like something, I'm happy, I'm sad. And then move it further to my favorite thing is fill in the blank. It could be favorite food, favorite game, color, um, whatever it is. And then um, 
expanding it totally open to favorite part of the day, um, a fun game to play. My best friend is um, just some fun questions that you guys can have a conversation about. And then when they answer yes or no, when they like something, then it's up to you to kind of give more information into that conversation. It doesn't just have to end with that yes or no. That could be all that they're going to provide, but then you're able to expand it further where you could say, I like the hamburger because it has ketchup or whatever you want to say with it. All right, our uh, next question here is, can you recommend any workbooks for writing skills and math skills? Uh, so yes, uh, one of the things that I would recommend to you for particularly writing is a program called Handwriting Without Tears. Uh, that's actually a program that we use here at Julie Bayard School. Um, but the, uh, the title uh, kind of tells it all, Handwriting Without Tears. Obviously, there's a lot of frustrations that can come along with the writing process. And this is a program that helps support those frustrations. Um, but if you go uh, you know, to the website for Handwriting Without Tears, you'll see that uh, you'll be able to purchase all different types of workbooks um, that uh, students can practice their writing uh, and fine motor skills in. Um, but the key thing about Handwriting Without Tears is it is a very structured and a very simplistic approach to teaching writing um, and teaching spatial awareness in the writing process. So certainly so take a look at Handwriting Without Tears. Um, it, it is a common uh, program for some schools, um, but it is uh, you know, certainly a, a very research and beneficial program. Uh, for math skills, uh, there, there are a number of different workbooks and different opportunities to practice uh, math skills. Um, but what I will say, the, the most important thing is the rote skills of recognizing uh, numbers, recognizing quantities, and then if your child is ready for the uh, addition and subtraction facts, you know, it, it's good to move into that direction as well. And that's where those flashcards come into play. Um, over time, you know, as a, as, a, as a society, we have moved away from, you know, the idea of flashcards and repetition. Um, and that repetition is very important. Um, so whether it's just flashcards for uh, recognizing numbers and symbols, as well as quantities, that's going to be important. And there's a number of different applications as well uh, that are uh, good applications that can be found on the iPad or a phone. Um, one is Splash Math. Uh, Splash Math is a pretty well-built program uh, that I would um, recommend as well. Um, for our next question, uh, it states that when will parents that applied for the child start at JB uh, know if they're eligible? Um, and so the, uh, I, will, I will tell you, based on the, the campus, uh, it's campus specific. Um, so if you certainly have a question, um, make sure you reach out to the principal of your campus, uh, just kind of see where the process is at. Because I will tell you, the kindergarten screening process at the Akron campus is at a different time frame than the kindergarten screening process at the Lindhurst campus. So, you know, certainly uh, reach out to your principal uh, at that specific campus for that question. But I can tell you for the Akron campus, we have our kindergarten screening process coming up next week. Uh, it goes from March 16th to the 19th. And for the uh, <coughs> kindergarten applicants who have already applied, uh, uh, they have already been scheduled. Um, so we are still scheduling additional students uh, for that kindergarten screening, uh, but that is coming up here shortly. Um, another question that I have here is our daughter has been at learner school for preschool. Uh, what would you recommend to understand if JB is a good fit for her transition to kindergarten and versus staying in her current program? Um, so uh, for those who may not know, Learner School is another school for uh, students with autism. It's a little bit more of an uh, intense program uh, built for more uh, moderate uh, to intense concerns. Um, but we do see uh, students transition from the Learner School to JB. Um, many times we've seen as a, a natural stepping stone for, us, for some of those students over at the Learner School. Um, but uh, first and foremost, you have to take a tour uh, of your of the uh, prospective campus 
Um, one of the, the beneficial things is to be able to see the environment uh, as a whole. Um, you, 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 you know, during that tour, you're going to talk a lot about small group versus whole group instruction. Um, you know, the beauty of Julie Billiard School is we're a small group environment. And a lot of our instruction happens in a small group. We're not a one-on-one -on -one setting, but we're a small group setting. And so it's important to talk through, uh, you know, current re receptive language skills uh, to kind of see how your child would react and respond in the small group environments that we are able to provide. Okay, so there's a question here about um, workbooks that they can go through during the summer to complete. Um, you may have already bought some of the summer bridge activities for pre-K to kindergarten. Um, and those are fun, I know what those are. Um, and you get a certificate at the end. Finding some that just focus on writing and other math with daily activities. Um, I know I've seen a lot of books um, at typical bookstores at Target, at Walmart. Summer Bridge is a great program but um, just any basic book that has the practice for them, the repetition, getting them exposed to the math problems, the numbers, um, writing letters and figuring out the sounds, matching words to pictures. Um, I don't have any specific brand name off the top of my head, but I know that just the exposure of it is going to be beneficial. And to add on to that, you know, when you're doing different workbooks and other uh, different activities at home, um, one of the most important things, you know, while that exposure to that workbook is important, uh, your structure uh, in implementing that process is actually even more important. So when your child goes to sit down, does your child, does your child have a specific place in your house that is kind of the, the workplace? Um, do they have a specific area? What does that organization look like for them? All those are important things to develop success for your child within those workbooks. Um, but when you're looking at different workbooks uh, for your child, one thing to keep in mind is the, the busyness that is within those workbooks. You're gonna find that some are more busier than others. Um, and there are things that you can do uh, to kind of help your child focus in on specific elements of that workbook. And that's simply covering up uh, portions of the page, you know, chunking things, having your child focus in on only specific elements uh, at a time. Because we know when, when we take in a lot of information at once, we get a lot of visual information, we can get overwhelmed. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, um, one last uh, final wrap up question here. Um, kind of goes back to the, uh, the social jar at dinner time and just some clarification around what does it mean by a structured approach to the conversations. Um, so to give you some examples around this and, and I'm, what I'm gonna do is kind of relate it to our classroom and what happens in the classroom. And so first and foremost, what we need to do is model. We need to model a response. And so we're gonna, we're gonna start with a general question. And let's say that general question is, um, you know, um, let's say we're talking about uh, cars, okay? A lot of our kids like cars. And we're starting to talk about, well, in the movie Cars, um, what was, who was your favorite character? And, you know, obviously uh, an obvious answer would be Lightning McQueen, um, or, or, or so forth. And so what you want to do is be able to bring somebody else into the picture, you know, help, help your child observe and watch the question being uh, asked, and then uh, someone providing a response back. And then the follow up after that is very important. And then you say, oh, wait, I like uh, Lightning McQueen as well too, demonstrating how you follow up to a response. And so, one of the, the important things you need to point that out, like, oh, wait a minute, I like uh, Lightning McQueen as well. You see how I just listened to that question? You see how, wait a minute, they were asking me, who was my favorite character? And you're kind of talking out loud. You're talking, you're talking through your process. 
who is my favorite character? My favorite character is Lightning McQueen. And then you have your other model, you know, dad or uh, older sibling. Go, hey, I like Lightning McQueen too. I heard you say you like Lightning McQueen. I like Lightning McQueen as well too. Um, so it's a lot of it is that that modeling aspect, being able to show and demonstrate and talk through that thinking process. Um, also, when it comes to structured conversations and conversational starters, um, you want to go through a sequence and show your, your show your child how you initially talk about a topic. Like oh, now, we're moving into a uh, a certain scene of cars. Uh, do you remember that, uh, that scene when Lightning McQueen did this? And then you know, you're waiting for a response. Yes, I do. Well, remember what happened? So-and-so did this and this happened. And so you're showing how you started with an initial topic and then you transferred over to a follow-up uh, question, to a follow-up answer, to a follow-up question, helping your child stay on topic uh, during that conversation. All right, so that comes, that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, I do want to thank everyone for being with us today. Um, certainly I hope you uh, were able to get uh, some good information as you're looking ahead at this upcoming school year for kindergarten. Uh, again, if you have any questions uh, directly for us here at Judy Bigger School, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we would be happy to help you. But then again, we thank you and we look forward to seeing you again with one of our upcoming webinars uh, later on in March. Thank you very much.